Namaskar and good afternoon to Ireland and good evening, good evening to our viewers who have joined us from India. Today's topic under the India Ireland Friendship Lecture Series is Promoting Positive Thinking Through Education, a Perspective from Ireland by Mr. John Doran. Mr. Doran is an educator, author and motivational speaker. He has been a teacher and guidance counselor for over 26 years. He is passionate about helping young people to grow and flourish in their field of interest within the limited means that life presents us of. His book, Ways to Wellbeing, also focuses on this aspect and is a guiding force for the children to make the best choices from the available options while coping up with the challenges of the life. His book is part of curriculum of almost 160 schools in Ireland. Mr. Doran motivates people from all walks of life through TED Talks and also has specialized smart training programs for management bodies, business organizations, education trusts, teachers, parents and students on resilience, EQ, well-being in the workplace, stress management and maximizing performances. Before I, before I invite Mr. Doran to motivate us all, I would request His Excellency the Ambassador of India for his introductory remarks. Okay. Thank you. Namaskar. My very warm greetings uh, to everyone uh, connected with this program uh, online and also in Ireland and also in India. Uh, the Indian Embassy is, is very delighted to welcome a celebrity uh, uh, speaker teacher like uh, John Dora. Uh, I personally had a, a great privilege of meeting him uh, a couple of times and every time I admire him uh, tremendously. In fact, my wife and I both feel motivated every time I meet him. We meet. Uh, and the topic that we have requested him to speak is uh, uh, based on his very, very inspiring work in uh, motivating young school children uh, because we grown-ups, adults and parents, we don't realize that uh, what kind of anxiety, what kind of stress uh, children go through. Very young age, uh, primary school children, they also have very difficult life. Uh, they go through very ch complex challenges, complex issues and we don't understand and we take it very lightly. And uh, uh, this topic is particularly relevant for our audience in India because Indian schools uh, are very merciless in burdening our young children. Uh, and also I feel that the spirit in the classrooms in India is a very fiercely, brutally competitive. Where uh, the best students, the high performing students, they attract a special attention from the teachers and the uh, the students who are not able to do as well academically, they are not only ignored but also they are harassed, humiliated and their dignity is not treated uh, with, with respect. Uh, and that is why I thought this topic will be very important for people in India to listen to. Uh, the young children need attention and they need sensitivity. They need uh, to be given self-confidence in pursuing their own interests. Uh, no true child uh, is identical. Uh, and also, each child has its, uh, his or her own special interests, abilities, and unless we enable him or her to do what he or she wants to do, her true potential will not be realized. Uh, and uh, this is the work that uh, Mr. Doran has been doing so effectively in Ireland, uh, in the field of Ireland, in the field of education, particularly the primary education. Ireland is a, a pioneer, uh, and today itself, um, I had interaction with two schools in uh, Monaghan, and very touched. The kind of things they are doing, uh, I wish I had access to when I was a child. Uh, with these words, uh, I extend a very warm welcome to the Indian Embassy and extend a very warm welcome to deliver this uh, very special uh, lecture under the India Island Friendship Lecture Series. 
and as I had mentioned to you that uh, the idea of this lecture series is to spread uh, wonderful stories from Ireland to people in India and also uh, some stories from India which are relevant to Ireland we are posting lectures from Indian dignitaries also uh, to, to spread uh, India's story in Ireland and Ireland story in India and uh, we are looking forward to your presentation and I am sure it will be very beneficial to young children in India, teachers in India, schools in India. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. After that warm introduction, I want to sit down and listen to myself. <laughs> they say the secret of successfully speaking in public is sincerity, but I'm sincere in my delight of joining Your Excellency and ladies and gentlemen to talk about a topic that's very personal to me, that in fact is my passion, and that is the progress, prosperity and happiness of well-being. So thank you very much indeed, Ambassador, for this opportunity. A lust for knowledge and a need for understanding are inscribed in the hearts of the best of men and women, as is the calling of the teacher. There is no craft more privileged to awaken in the hearts and minds of another human being powers and dreams beyond your own, to induce in another a love of that for which one loves. This, Steiner said, is a threshold adventure like no other. And yet, it's a threshold adventure that's never had more challenges, not least the challenge of change. We find our teachers stressed, pressed, distracted and drained. So I suppose the question is, how do we add to the well of our young people's well-being? I know of no other profession other than the noble profession of parenting that speaks closer to purpose than the profession of teaching. I think in adding to the well of well-being, the secret really is in that word being. We're human beings, not human doings. We've got trapped in a tyranny of busyness. We're counting our minutes and we're missing our moments. We've forgotten the art of doing nothing of just sitting down and being, of letting young people play rather than constantly doing. So I'm going to propose that self-efficacy has a real case to be made as a compulsory area of study in curriculums that are overloaded in content. We really need to have a, a, a cultivate an attitude of looking at a skill set that will help young people not just survive but thrive. We need to nourish in order to flourish. So I'm going to ask us a couple of questions, but I'd like to begin by talking about two words that I think are two of the most underutilized words in the English language, and they are thank you. They're like verbal sunshine. You know, I've never met a parent or a teacher who are overdosed on appreciation or suffered a surplus of gratitude. And wherever I speak in the world, I always tell people or remind people that if you think back upon your life and the people that made a difference, quite often there was a teacher involved. I know and I don't think I'm breaking any confidence, but His Excellency's dad was a teacher of some renown. And I know he's spoken of with warm affection whenever I have the pleasure of talking to His Excellency about it. So I try to remind people that a teacher said to me one time, John, to be a teacher, you have to want to be mad. I said, explain that to me. And she said, well, you have to want to be mad. You have to want to make a difference. And that's what teachers do. And when I tell people, when I speak, I said, look, if there's a, a teacher who was the oasis in your desert, who was like a warm fire on a cold day, don't waste an opportunity to thank them. Renew and repair your relationships. And a young person took me up on it by the name of Smithy and he looked back in his old book and the, the teacher who had helped him in his, in his time of need was Mr. Jones. And he decided to write a letter to him, an email, found an old email, he said, Dear Mr. Jones, I was at a talk by a person called John Doran and he said to thank somebody who had a very serious impact on your life in a positive way. 
That person for me was you, Mr. Jones. You were like a warm smile on a cold day when things were very difficult. You were the person who believed in me when even I didn't believe in me. I just want you to say, or wanted you to know that I'm doing very well. I wasn't academic. I wasn't particularly good at school. To be honest with you, I remember telling you that I felt like an alien who had been landed on Earth and who had been damaged on impact. And to be honest with you, Mr. Jones, education and the system damaged me as well. But you looked out for me. You were my woodwork teacher. And I want you to know that I make kitchens for a living now. I'm married with two children and an enhanced appreciation of education on all who sail on Earth. I hope you're well. Go well. Yours sincerely, Smithy. Have you ever had anything on your mind that has been kind of going around like baggage on a carousel and finally you get to it, you slow down, you take that pause in a world of busy and you get to the things that are important. This was his moment and it was almost a cathartic feeling of relaxation when he pressed send on the email. Not expecting a reply, which came within 10 minutes. Smithy, is that you? Forget you? Trust me, nobody has forgotten you in our parish. Thank you so much for your email. I am approaching 70 now, but from the wrong direction. I feel a little bit like a leaf languishing in the last vestiges of autumn. In my 35 year career as a teacher, no one has ever thanked me. Thank you so much for thinking of me, Smithy, and I enclose a picture of our infamous trip to Scarborough. That's you, top left, knees knocking in the wind. Do you remember that wind, Smitty? We called it the lazy wind. It wouldn't go around you, it would go straight through you. Go well, Smitty. I'm glad you're going well and the life has been kind to you. Thanks for thinking of me. Yours sincerely, Mr. Jones. But that's not the end of the story because the following week, he got a message or a phone call with a private number which he didn't tend to answer. And something inside of himself said, answer the call. And his suspicions were immediately raised further when the person said, may I speak to Mr. Smith, please? And he said, speaking, waiting for perhaps a customer who wasn't happy or some sort of conversation. And the person on the other side of the phone said, my name is Mrs. Jones. I just wanted to inform you that my husband passed away yesterday. But this is not a sad phone call. All he could think about and talk about was a school he loved, a profession he adored, and a young man called Smithy. Thank you, Smithy. Thank you for getting there on time. That's the power and the magic of the profession of teaching. But can I introduce you to Michael? He is a young man in a school in Dublin or in Delhi. He's 17. And he has a couple of questions for us. The future is important to Michael because it's where he intends to spend most of his time. He has a sister, Sarah, who is in primary school. Now, Michael's world is different to ours. Michael doesn't want to own a piece of the world. He simply wants to visit it. A passport and a mobile phone and he's good to go anywhere in the world. Michael won't talk about a job for life like dinosaurs like me. He'll talk about a job for the life of the contract. Michael will have between 15 and 18 jobs over the course of his lifetime. The McKinsey report recently said that 80% of the jobs that will be available to Michael in 2030 haven't been invented yet. So Michael is wondering, are we trying to educate him for a world that does not exist in a system that's perfect design for a world that no longer is here? Are we preparing Michael for a life of tests or for the tests of life? And what do we mean by well-being? Well, I think well-being is about the will and the skill to courageously embrace whatever life throws at us. To help us deal with the snakes and ladders in the luggage of a lifetime. You know that Paul McCartney went back to Liverpool quite recently to open a school of music. And he said that over primary school and secondary school, both him and Ringo Starr, half of one of the most famous bands that have ever graced the world, and nobody ever realised he had a talent in music. 
John Cleese of Monty Python fame, Basil Fawlty himself, said, I can go one better. I went through primary school, secondary school, and university, and nobody ever realised I had a talent for comedy. I think that schools and education don't serve our young people if any young person leaves the school without a sense of optimism, without a sense of place and space, without a sense of their strengths, without a sense of their values, I think we could say that they're well schooled, but not necessarily well educated. We need, like never before, a well educated young population, but something is going wrong. Now, as the ambassador said, I speak a lot about well-being, but I have to say, I've started to really bridle at the word. I fear, and a lot of my colleagues fear, that it has become a cliche. It has become another stick to beat colleagues with in schools. If society gets an itch, schools are expected to scratch it. But what does it actually mean? And I've often thought that there's two things you can do with a box. You can tick it, or you can think outside of it. And I think a lot of, in my opinion, well-being has become a bit of a, a box-ticking exercise. A compatriot and a brother of India is Deepak Chopra. He goes one further. He says, why not get rid of the box? Perhaps we need a new paradigm, and perhaps the time is now. The very best time to plant an oak tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is now. You know there's been a lot of talk after COVID of going back to normal. I'm not so sure that's a good idea because normal wasn't working for too many people and normal is not working for too many young people. I think it's interesting that never over the last five years particularly has there been more emphasis on well-being but more on happiness with young people. The World Health Organization tells us that by the year 2030, the biggest killer, the biggest disease that will kill most people is depression. So we need to change what we're doing and quickly. And the best, the best definition of education I've ever heard is that it's a conversation between one generation and another about what's really important in life. We need to equip young people with what I call, or what people have called, I think erroneously, soft skills. I actually think soft skills are essential skills. Communication. We have young people who can communicate and they have contacts on Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram that are a mile wide and they're an inch deep. They've lost what I call conversational intelligence. A lot of young people are lonely. They're the most connected generation in the history of the world and paradoxically the most disconnected. 75% of young people spend 75% of their time looking down. We're not wired to be always on. You know, I often say to people of every generation, be careful of too much CNN, constant negative news. Have you ever noticed the newsreader comes on in the evening and says, good evening, and then proceeds to tell you all the reasons why it's not a good evening. <laughs> so it's the negativity bias. And I'm going to introduce, and I think I'm going beyond the word well-being, when we're talking about self-efficacy, to two words that I'm more comfortable with. And one is mental fitness. Has it ever occurred to you that we spend more time on our dental hygiene than we do on our mental hygiene? Have you ever noticed that the conversations with yourself rarely end well? Young people are very hard on themselves and never more so to have the needed hope. And so I'm advocating for strategic optimism and I'll explain what that means. But what do I mean by mental fitness? I, I mean emotional agility. The understanding and the awareness of the transience of emotions. We are creatures of emotions, not rationality. So it's very impo important that we realise that we carry these emotions with us. And common sense would tell us that we leave our emotions at the door, at home, when we come to the world of work or school. Nothing could be further from the truth. So dealing with our emotional landscape is an essential 21st century skill. What will the world of the future look like for my children? Well, they say that the factories of the future will have two things, a man and a dog, a man to feed the dog and a dog to keep the man away from the machines. But the USP going forward will be the human being. No 
artificial intelligence can, can successfully reconstruct empathy. The awareness of our emotional weather, our ability to regulate it, and the ability to empathize with others. George Bernard Shaw said, I respectfully disagree with Shakespeare. Life is no brief candle to me. Rather, it is a magnificent torch that I have hold of for a while, and it is my obligation to shine it as brightly as I can for as long as I can. Emile Zola said, I didn't come into this world to visit it. I came here to live out loud. Isn't that what we want mostly for our young people? And the research backs that up. In third place, we want our young people to be safe. It's a difficult, turbul turbulent, volatile, uncertain, and changing world out there. It's very ambiguous. Secondly, we want them to educationally attain something. Of course, that's important. That's why they go to school. But fundamentally, all of the research will indicate we want our young people to be happy. So how do we do that in a world that's constantly busy? The, the days, the months, the weeks, the years, they pass by frenetically, like cat's eyes on the motorway. A teacher said to me, John, don't tell me to slow down. All that's keeping me together is the tension. My own wife retired on one day, and she had the lovely ability to be able to say, Goodbye tension, hello tension. So slowing down and seeing if what we're doing is working is a really important juncture right now. To see what's serving us and see what's not serving us. What are the skills that are going to be needed for young people to thrive going forward? And, and sometimes I put this figure up on the board. And if I ask for your feedback of what you see, there's a gentleman at the back saying, that last one is wrong. Did you say you're a teacher? I hope it's not maths. <laughs> but there's a gentleman over to here who said, he got three right. Isn't he fantastic? And I love his chat. And I call this the one quarter line principle. You see, are you interrogating success? Or are you pointing out that you missed it? You see, our brains are wired to point out the flaws and the negatives. And I call this, the one four nine is, I call it strategic optimism. We've never needed more strategic optimism in young people. And please don't mistake me when I, I'm not talking about a Pollyanna, everything is okay, disregard reality type of optimism. But I'm talking about an optimism that Professor Martin Newman says, nothing is more linked to success than. It's an explanatory style of looking to the horizon, to look at what's good, the benefits, the solutions, and the possibilities. You see, when we're overtly negative and cast our eyes to the 15s, the adversities, the problems, navel gazing on what's wrong. We can tend to get sucked into what I call the trap of the three Ps. That things are personal, permanent, or pervasive. It's my fault. It's always my fault and it's never going to change. That gets trapped in this cycle of what we call, or Martin Selvin calls, learned helplessness. Where I actually feel detached from my ability to solve the problem, to seek the solutions, to seek the possibilities. I hope I'm not breaking confidence, Your Excellency, but I was very touched by a story you told me when I had the privilege and the pleasure of sharing your hospitality with your lady wife in your home. And uh, you told me about your affection and fondness for teaching and that it had been one of your aspirations as you were younger. And because of circumstances, that wasn't the path that you pursued. And I was thinking that at that time, it must have been a tremendous disappointment for you, a huge 15. However, you turn that 15 into a 149 because you then applied for the civil service. And I would respectfully say you spend a lifetime as a teacher, a teacher of example. And I sometimes say to young people, how do you get from 15 to a 149? And the two questions that I ask myself to change the frame, because if you change the viewing, you change the doing. In business, they call it appreciative inquiry looking at what's going well and working on it, rather than a kind of a deficit model of living or of life. And the questions that I ask myself are, what's the gift in this experience? And what is this present moment teaching me? And I meet so many people that life has affected in hugely adverse ways. Maybe they've lost their health. Or, or, and I often ask them, you know, our COVID was very difficult for a lot. A lot of people found it very difficult. And I asked one person about my acquaintance, what was the lesson in the 15 of COVID for you? And he said, I no longer go mountaineering over molehills. 
I no longer get bogged down in ticks or small things. I realise that people need people. And as great as Facebook is and Zoom is, and 18 months ago Zoom was something on the end of a camera lens for me, and now we're Zooming all over India. Isn't it fantastic? But nothing replaces people to people contact. And that's the lesson in COVID for me as well. So having a 149 mentality and mindset, I think is really, really important indeed. Sometimes a young person, or not so young, and sometimes when I'm giving a talk, a, a parent will come up to me and say, why didn't anybody tell me this or teach me this when I was young? And it's so important because it's a conversation about life. And the average life, believe it or not, is 900 months, if you're lucky. That's 4,000 weeks, that's 28,000 days. 300 of those months you'll spend sleeping. So that's 600 months consciously on this small blue marble that we love to call Earth. When I tell anybody underneath the age of 10, that news tends to land quite well. When I tell teenagers, they say, Mr. Doran, that's like forever. And when I tell people of my vintage, there's a furtive glance at the mobile phone to do a quick calculation to see what's left. <laughs> and I always say, not enough. <laughs> you know, life is about people. It's about not missing those moments that we're alive in. And if I was asked, What's the single biggest happiness hack that I know? To, take the, to get the best out of yourself rather than the stress out of yourself. To actually turn up as the best version of you. Well, the hack I would give you is to lower the threshold of what you're grateful for. And when I had the pleasure and the privilege of speaking to colleagues in, in Australia, a woman came up to me who had been living in Hungary in the 50s under, under occupation. And uh, she said that every now and again in Budapest, a, a band would come uh, from Vietnam with bananas of all things. And we would go down and carry as many bananas as we could carry at a four and bring them back to our little one bedroom apartment. And we would put them in a darkened cupboard and we'd watch them ripen and go from green to yellow. And she said in a city that was so grey, watching those bananas go from green to yellow was like magic. I said, growing up I thought there was only three colours in the world. Grey, brown and black. And now and again my dad would bring us on a treasure hunt. What to see? All the good in the world. All the colour in the world. And all that's positive in the world. You know there's a lovely phrase Your Excellency in Irish. Beckin shul gruma sail gruma. A gloomy eye sees a gloomy world. So it's very important that we help young people have hope because hope in the future gives power to the present. You know, I've been reflecting a lot on the relationship between our great nations, Ireland and India, and there's so much synergy between us as a people, as a mindset, and as a mentality. And one of our great cultural exports across the world is you two, who were recently honoured by the Kennedy Honours America's highest cultural accolade. And President Joe Biden said something in his opening remarks to Bono. He said that Ireland is the only nation in the world that he knows that is nostalgic for the future. I actually respectfully disagree because I think you could say India is there as well. We're nostalgic for the future. We're eternally optimistic. We're irrepressibly optimistic. We're possibilitarians. We have great hope in our young people. And I suppose what we're trying to do is give them that will and skill to survive, to nourish and help them to flourish. So actually having that explanatory style is really, really important. Now, I didn't clear this with His Excellency, but I wanted to give you a bit of a gift. I think it was Leonard Cohen who said, Ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering, for there is a crack in everything. That is how the light gets in. You know, these weapons of mass distraction that are our mobile phones are very difficult for our young people to navigate. These weapons of mass distraction, the digital din of ping and ding, 24 hours a day, always on. You know, I think we could say we're involved in a social experiment. The out 
con outcome of which is still to be determined. You know, and I think um, in the 60s we were told that smoking was good for us. And I was just saying in earlier remarks that I'm hoping that in the future we don't see constant use of screens as the equivalent of smoking on the lungs. That's how difficult it is for young people. And they're trapped in a world of continuing comparison. And they're never enough, they're never smart enough or tall enough or intelligent enough. They never win comparing their unedited lives to the heavily curated lives of the Instagrammers and the influencers. And the little gift I'd like to share with you is the secret sauce of credibility and motivation of young people. It's only taken me 29 years to find it out. I'm a slow learner, Your Excellency, but I got there just in time. And I can even pinpoint for you the exact time and date I got this street credibility with young people. It was January the 6th. I had just returned to school. It was five past two, and a young man who normally came into my class to sleep was remarkably alert. I didn't know what was going on. It was very disconcerting to see the attention he was playing in my class. To such an extent, I, with concern, at the end of it, I said, Paul, are you okay? You were very much in danger of learning something there. You looked like you were paying attention. He said, Mr. Dorn, can I ask you a question? I said, certainly. He said, are you on LinkedIn? I said, I am. He said, my brother follows you on LinkedIn. I said, well, thank you for telling me. He said, did you have a post on January the 1st? And I got six and a half million views. I said, I did. And he looked at me in the eye very earnestly and he said, respect Mr. Dorn. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you what that post was. Because I think there's a very powerful secret, not just for young people, but for yourself as well. You see, it was about a famous actor called Clint Eastwood. And he was on the ninth hole of a golf course with his friend having a round. He was 92 years young, just turned. And his friend, who was a number of decades younger, said, Clint, are you up to much at the moment? What's keeping you busy? What's on your plate at the and Clint stopped for a second and he looked back and he said, well, if you must know, I'm starting a film in the morning. I wrote it, I'm directing it, and I'm starring in it. And if you wouldn't mind hurrying up, you're holding me back here. I've got places to go, people to see, and things to do. And he gave him that famous Clint glint. <laughs> and the friend looked at him and he said, Clint, how do you do? You've got the energy of a man half your age. And Clint smiled, looked at him and said, I refuse to let the old man in. And I thought that was a lovely metaphor for fear. You know, a lot of our young people, a lot of ourselves are afraid. We're, 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 we're afraid we're not good enough. We're, we're, we're afraid that, 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 that what we have and what we're doing as a parent, as a partner, as a friend, as a, as a professional, just not cut it anymore. And when fear is writing the script of your life, the working title is always, I'm not good enough. You see, you're born with two fears, and two fears only. The fear of loud noises and the fear of falling over. All the other fears are picked up along the way. The fear of missing out, the fear of failure. The fear of, 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 of not fitting in, the fear of not being good enough. And what I've kind of come to discover is that trying to find that enoughness outside of yourself, it's like looking for a shark in the desert. It's simply not there. A person after a talk one day said, you know what, John, I spent all my professional life trying to climb to the top of the tree before I realized I was backing up the wrong one. You see, happiness is an inside job. It's an experience, not an experience. But what if, what if you allow yourself, entertain the possibility that you where you are and you always will be enough by sheer manner of being alive? It changes your energy and after all that's all we are is energy vibrating through this universe for a finite time. It changes that energy from one of constant fear and anxiety. School refusals, school refusals 
and levels of anxiety are at epidemic levels in our schools right across this nation and I suspect in India as well. Fear of not living up to the expectations of our parents. Fear of not fitting in, of not being good, of being the alien who crashed landed to earth and was damaged at one impact. But what if we change that constant fear and anxiety to one of effort and application? What if we allow ourselves, entertain the possibility that we were and we are and we always will be enough? We liberate our energy to give the best we can with the ability we have in the time that we've got and in the space that we're in. We actually change the frame and we start seeing mistakes as vile, very interesting learning experiences. Show me the man who never made a mistake and I'll show you a person who never made anything. You know, we start to see fail as first attempt in learning, as an essential life skill. Keep failing, fail more, fail quicker, learn more, learn quicker. Focus on your integrity, and I love what Gandhi said about integrity, that it was the congruence between what you say, what you think, and what you do. To be unapologetically yourself in a world that's continually encouraging you to be a creature of a commonplace and to be a second mate somebody else. To live out loud, as the Neil Zola said. That's your birthright. And that's what we want for our young people. Would you agree? We want them to be themselves, unapologetically, unambiguously themselves. To give them the roots of responsibility and the wings of independence to soar. To be all they can be with all that they have in the time that they've got and in the space that they're in. And that to me is, is, the, is the crucial element of education. I'd like to leave you with a, a, a little story, if I may. Um, funny, I would think it was Helen Keller who said this, Your Excellency. I think she said that no pessimist ever discovered the secrets of the stars or set forth and set sail for uncharted waters or opened a new haven to the human spirit. We've never needed to be more optimistic. Our young people deserve it. And for yourselves, what I would say, I hope you always remember you know, what's important and you never remember what's not. And lastly, the little story that I wanted to share, which uh, um, I've always been taken by the hospitality of His Excellency. And a friend of mine came, Your Excellency, and you've seen a lot of Ireland, and I would encourage you to go to a beautiful part of Ireland called the Burren in County Clare. And a friend of mine from England was there. Normally he would be with his wife, but on this occasion she couldn't travel with him. And she leaves down in the hotel and he put in for an early morning alarm clock call, 7 a.m. to get the most of the day. And he was surprised to be woken by a person. You know, we go away now and we get automated calls. So it was lovely to hear a human voice, that emotional intelligence. And the person said, top of the morning to you, John. My name is Wayne. You're very welcome to the barn. If you happen to be traveling, on the outside today to make sure you bring a sweater. It can be very, very cold out there. You may be wondering why I didn't wake you at 7.15, like you asked, and why I'm waking you 15 minutes earlier at seven, because you have an Irish breakfast waiting for you, and you'll need an extra 15 minutes to eat it. <laughs> John smiled to himself, put down the phone, and said, thank you, Wayne. And he said, golly, it's true, that famous Irish welcome, Kate May your Fodja, is alive and well in the barn. But it was nice to hear a friendly voice in a faraway land. He brushed his teeth and John being John went down to thank Wayne for that little personal touch oh. and to thank him. And uh, he went to find the manager and uh, the lady said, I'm sorry, the manager's not in at the moment. He won't be in on shift until 12, 12 p.m. Oh, I said, it must have been him. He went looking for that very astute and intelligent concierge. But the name on the badge was not Wayne. It transpired that Wayne was the lowest on the food chain of the he was the bellboy who would bring the bags from the boot of the car through the carousel in through the front door. Wouldn't even get the luxury of going to the bedroom to get a tip. There was a wooden plate to the left of the door and on top of it it said, the most important person in the world is now in front of me. And John said, that was Wayne's world. And I suppose that's what we want young people to realise, that they are important. They have a place and a space in this world. And education, if it's to live up to that meaning of it, it's not about filling jugs, it's about lighting fires 
and let's hope that we do these young people a, a service in the future. And remember what that young person said, the future is important to me. Is it safe in your hands? But I know from the teachers that I've met in Ireland and from what His Excellency tells me about the teachers in India, they are in safe hands in the teachers of both of our jurisdictions. And may God save them. And thank you very much indeed, Your Excellency, for listening to me today. Thank you very much indeed.